Okay, so thank you for coming. No, I'm kidding. You have to come. You pay money. All right. So um, we are going to talk today about probability distributions. I've been alluding to this the last couple lectures. Uh, you'll see what I mean. And so when we talk about probability, um, underlying that is something called a probability distribution. It governs the, the chance, the probability of certain events happening. Okay. And you're already familiar with one probability distribution, even though you may not call it that, and that's the normal distribution or the Gaussian distribution, the bell-shaped curve. That's a dis probability distribution, most common one. We're going to talk about that um, on Tuesday. Okay. So everyone knows the homework is due on Tuesday because we got behind schedule. And you should probably check out the schedule because everything got pushed back for the next few weeks because of um, the snow day on Tuesday. All right. So I'm going to talk about introduce the general idea of probability distributions and then I'm going to talk about two different kinds. One is discrete. So in that case the random variables of so-called discrete variable can assume finite number of possibilities. That would be like flipping a coin. It's discrete. And then I'll talk about things that are probably usually of more interest to us as chemical engineers which are continuous probability distributions <coughs> of which the normal Gaussian distribution is the primary example we'll talk about next time. And then I'll talk about something called expectation and moments. Um, that's important um, because it's terminology people use, so when you hear it, you need to know what they're talking about. Okay, so I kind of said this the first day. I talked about statistics, but um, one can think of, so if you're doing an experiment, let's say you go into the 401 or 402 lab, which you'll do in a few years, and you'll do some experiments on some piece of equipment. You'll collect data, okay? And so one way to think about, so let's say you're measuring a variable, okay? One way to think about this is each one of the measurements you obtain, which we call a sample typically, is a random sample, which means it's drawn in an unbiased way, which I'll explain, from some underlying unknown probability distribution. So by probability distribution, as I'll explain, that means some things are more likely to occur than others, okay? Um, typically. Like flipping a coin, right, there's an equal probability, but most things we're interested in, there's a different probability of different events occurring and that the probability of each of those occurring is governed by this thing called probability distribution. And when you do an experiment, you're taking a sample from this distribution. It's random, okay? So that means that sometimes you'll, you'll get a different answer every time you do it, but the probability of getting a certain value is going to be governed by this distribution, okay? So if you were fortunate or unfortunate, I guess, depending on your perspective, and you could um, obtain an infinite number of samples, you could construct this function, right? It's like you guys, you know what a histogram looks like, right? So if you, I'm notoriously poor drawer, but let's give it a shot here. So, so this would be like some variable x you're interested in, and this would be the number of times that n value x is obtained. Right? And so you can form things like this that look like a histogram, right? So you know this, the values of x in that range occurred 10 times value and that occurred 6 times, this is 3 times, you know, histogram, okay? Now if you were to collect an infinite number of samples <coughs> and made these things infinitely small, the width of these bars, you'd get a probability distribution. Of course the problem you face is that you can't do an infinite number of experiments because it's too expensive and time consuming. Okay, so what we're usually trying to do, or what we're often trying to do, is obtain information about the underlying probability distribution from a small number of samples, okay? So for example, if you want to calculate the mean, okay, the true mean is going to, as I'll prove to you today or show you, is the mean of the underlying probability distribution, but what you try to do is calculate the mean from 10 samples, right? Like you're not going to do 100,000 or 10 million experiments to try to figure out the average, okay? So usually, small number of samples try to figure out some underlying property of the distribution, like its variance, its mean, things like this, okay? And this number of samples is usually small because experiments are, are um, expensive. So the, the price we pay here, if you're going to do a small number of experiments, you can never be 100% confident. I, I hope this makes sense to you. So if, if, I, if you said, oh, this is the mean, like I took 10 samples and this is the mean, um, there's going to be some uncertainty that that's the true mean, unless you take an infinite number of samples. The more samples you take, the less the uncertainty will be, <laughs> okay? So um, we're going to learn 
next week or the week after how to actually characterize that uncertainty, that variability, if you will, in the estimate. But for now, let's just say we, we're trying to understand the underlying probability from a small number of samples. Okay. So that's one thing. And then when we go later in the course and we do things like hypothesis testing, um, we're going to use things, certain type of distributions that are used for data analysis. So the point I'm trying to make on this slide is these, this idea of a probability distribution is underlying a lot of statistical thinking and theory. And so it's, we're going to build on it, so it's important to understand what they are. Okay. My neck's already hurting, so I'm going to step back over here. Okay, so we already talked about random variables, right? So, if, you know, the, the thing you have to give up when you start thinking about statistics is the idea that if you do the ex same experiment, you'll get the same answer. Okay? So we're, we get, what we're doing is we're sampling a random variable, and this random variable that's reflected in the measurement we might take is not reproducible in a deterministic way. So every time you do it, you get a different answer. Okay? And you know, even though we're not interested in flipping coins or rolling dice, this is the kind of thing I'm talking about, right? So if you flip a coin, that's a random event. You don't know if it's going to be heads or tails. Okay? And we talked about this already. Um, each measurement's viewed as a random variable. We usually call that random variable X, capital X, and a sample is a little x, right? And this is defined on some sample space of an experiment. You remember I did that thin film example where I said the sample space, there was t three events that made up the sample space. One was it was too thin, one it was too thick, and one it was okay, okay? So the sample space is made up of a set of events. <coughs> And the um, union of all those events makes the sample space. That's all possible things that could happen as a result of the experiment. Okay. So when we start talking about probability distribution, we're going to use this term, or this function, I should say, f of x. Okay. So f is the probability. It depends on x, which is the random variable. Okay. So if you're talking about a discrete distribution, that means this, this variable x is a discrete variable. It can take on discrete values. One, two, three, four, five, six, whatever, okay? If it's a continuous distribution, which we're usually more interested in, then it can take on continuous val real values. Like, if this was a probability distribution that governed the temperature of a reactor, the, re the reactor temperature is a continuous variable. Okay, so that'd be a continuous probability distribution. <coughs> okay, so you're gonna have to get Comfortable. We talk uh, typically about two types of distributions. One is, this is called actually, as we'll talk about, the probability density function. Okay, and then we're interested in the cumulative distribution function. Okay, so what this function tells me is what's the probability that the random variable x will be little x. Okay, what this other function tells me is what's the probability this random variable will be less than or equal to the value x. You get the difference. So this is that it'll be that value, this will be less than or equal to that value. Okay. So when I use capital F of X, I'm talking about what's called the cumulative distribution function. <clears throat> and again, it's the probability that the random variable will assume a value X or less. So if I, if I ask the question, for example, this is called the interval probability, I want to know what's the probability the random variable will be between B, B, between B and A the way you can compute that is find the, find the cumulative distribution function, evaluate that at B, and subtract off the value at A. Okay? So this tells you, so that's the probability it'll be B or less. This is the probability it'll be A or less. So that to be in between there is you subtract the two. Okay? All right. All right, so first of all, I'll talk about discrete probability distributions. So in this case, X, the random variable, can assume Countably, you know what countably mean? It doesn't mean you, you want to count them, it just means you could. <laughs> like the integers are countable, although I don't suggest trying, okay? Um, so it's countably infinite, actually. Um, so this can assume some number of discrete values. Usually it's a finite num pretty small finite number of possibilities, right? Flipping a coin, two uh, outcomes, heads or tails, right? Rolling a dice, um, six outcomes. How many outcomes do you, or events, I could say, or outcomes? How many, how many possibilities do you think there are if you roll t um, two dice? It's not very hard, people. That's kind of right, but that's not quite. So there's 12 possible things that can happen in the sense you get one, two, up to 12, right? But 36 is what you need to know to calculate the probability of each of those actually occurring. 
All right, so the definition here is pretty simple. So when, when you're in a class like this and you see things that look like this, okay, or this or this, um, why do I write things like this? It's because it's the most efficient way to provide the information. The key is to understand what this means, okay? Like, that's the way math is. People have a nomenclature, they use it. It's kind of like saying, like when we two talk about two sets, we say that means the union of sets A and B, right? That's much better than writing the union of sets A and B in words, okay? So this is the same kind of thing. All I'm saying with this equation or this expression here is that I'm defining this probability function. I sh you know, more in many places they'll actually call this the probability density function, but in the book it calls it probability function, so that's what I call it. So what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to some value, pj, okay, if, so pj is the probability that x will, the random variable x will assume that value, xj. So in other words, if x is equal to xj, then this function equals pj, it equals zero otherwise. You'll, you'll, see, you'll see a picture of this in a minute. Maybe I should just go to one now, okay? So there's the probability density function of rolling a dice, right? What's the probability of rolling one half? Zero. You can't roll one half on a dice, right? So it's got a probability you can't roll zero either. You can roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six, and they're all equally likely. The probability of each one is one six, right? Because those have to add up to one. So that's, that's what I mean. And so this is a general definition of that kind of thing, okay? So when you see things like this, you know, some people are very comfortable with this kind of thing. I like it. But it's important that you kind of translate, usually it's helpful to translate it into a picture, is my experience, right? So if you see this, it doesn't make a lot of sense, you look at this, then you go back, then I think it makes a lot more sense, okay? So it's equal to pj if x equals xj, and it equals zero otherwise, okay? All right, so this is the cumulative. So, the cum so if we have the probability function f, and we want to obtain the cumulative function, we just sum so what we're asking here, recall, if we say what's the cumulative distribution function at x, it means what is the probability the random variable be x or less, okay? So all you have to do to compute that is just add up the probabilities here. So for example, what's the probability of rolling a 3 or less? Add up the probability of rolling a 3, a 2, and a 1. That, that's what this equation is telling you right here. Just add those probabilities up. You want to know what the probability is this random variable, discrete variable, be between b and a. Take the cumulative function at b, subtract off the cumulative function at a. In other words, add up all the probabilities between a and b. Okay. And by definition here, all these probabilities have to add to 1. Right? So we, 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 we're not allowing prob... So by definition of the distribution function, if it's discrete, if you sum over this function all possibilities, which means summing all the probabilities, they have to sum to 1. If it's continuous, which we'll see, the integral under the curve has to be equal to 1. Same thing. Okay? All right. So, here are some examples, um, one of which I've already shown you. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So these are taken right out of the book, so you can look at them there. So this is the probability function for rolling what they say is a fair dice. <laughs> means, by fair it means it's equally likely you'll get any of the numbers, right? So there's only six possible outcomes. That's definitely countable. You can roll a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And they're all equally likely. And since the probability has to sum up to one, that means they all have to be one-sixth, right? I mean, it, you don't need statistics to figure that one out, all right? Now, corresponding to that function is the cumulative distribution function, okay? So you see it has this staircase kind of structure. So, for example, here, for the cumulative function, you're asking, what's the probability I'll roll a 1 or less? That's the same as the probability of rolling a 1, because you can't roll less, okay? When you go to 2, you're asking yourself, what's the probability I'll roll a 2 or less? That means 2 or 1. That'll be 2 sixths, right? Three or less, that'll be three six, also known as one half, and so on and so forth. What's probably I'll roll six or less? One. You gotta roll something. Okay? All right. 
So now back to the case that you commented on, and that's what, if you roll two dice, okay, it looks a little bit different, right? So first of all, you have to say, how many possibilities are there if you roll two dice? Well, there's 36, right? Six squared. Each dice has two possibilities, there are two, two dice. How many ways can you roll three dice? Um, six to the three, right? Whatever that is. 36 times six, <laughs> whatever. All right. 216 maybe that is? I'm not sure. All right. So, if we, so this is the cumulative distribution function I'm showing here. And so if someone says, or asks, what is the probability I can roll a one? That probability is zero, right? You can't roll two dice and get a one. Okay. What's the probability I'll roll a two? Well, you know, this comes back to like combinations and permutations. How many, there's 36 possible ways you could, 36 possible outcomes when you roll the two dice, right? How many of those will lead to two? There's only one possibility. You roll, both dice have to be one, right? So probability of getting a two is, you, it's hard to see here, but that's one thirty-sixth. okay? What's the probability of rolling a three? There's two ways to get a three. Two, one, one, two. That's two over 36, but this, you're asking yourself, what's the probability I'll get two or less? <laughs> so there's the, the probability of getting a two plus the probability of getting a one, that's three over 36. You see how this works? Once you get up to, I guess, four, it's not that interesting. But when you get, for example, to five, right, you can roll a one and a five, a two and a three, a three and a two, a five and a one. There's four possibilities, and so on and so forth. So that's why you see the kind of the incremental, there's a big increase in the middle for each, each going to each higher number because there's more possibilities of obtaining that, okay? And eventually you get up to one. Whoops. All right? Okay. So even though it looks like we're primarily interested in flipping coins and, and games of chance here, <laughs> um, these will have applications you'll see in like quality control and manu discrete manufacturing and things like that. Okay? All right. So let's, let's do a little example here. I made up this example for fun um, just to illustrate how we might use some of these concepts. Not very sophisticated or complex. So I said something pretty vague here. Assume the probability of performing exactly X su successful experiments in a row is governed by this probability, okay? So in other words, the, the probability that you'll get uh, one successful experiment in a row exactly, right, just one, not two and not zero, is this, okay? The probability you'll get two experiments in a row is this, three, this, four is this. I should have said, to, to make this really sensible, I should have said there's only four possible, you're only doing four experiments, right, to do this, okay. So it's most likely you get three um, experiments in a row that are successful, but there are other possible outcomes, okay. All right, so this is, this is a definition, I'm just telling you, this is the probability function for this problem, okay. So when you have any problem that you're going to deal with, um, and you want to do the kind of things that we're going to norm normally do, you have to assume this function. You wouldn't never assume this, right? But that's where probably a distribution functions like the um, normal distribution comes in, because for most of the stuff we do in the class, we'll assume that's the distribution function. Usually you don't know, you understand? Like you collect data for the extrusion process in lab. There's no fundamental principle that says the data is governed by a normal distribution. It's just the assumption one makes, okay? But in this case, I'm explicitly giving you this distribution. So it's pretty easy, I would like to think, to calculate the cumulative distribution. So that says, what's the probability of x being less than or equal to 1? The same probability of it being 1. What's the probability of being le less than or equal to 2? Well, add the probability of it being 2 to the probability of it being 1, 0.4, and so on, right? That's fairly, fairly easy. All right, so then these are called interval probabilities. Someone might ask you, what's the probability x will be between 3 and 1? Well, obviously, and you notice here the uh, greater than or equal signs matter. This says <coughs> greater than or, sorry, less than or equal to 3. This says greater than 1, not including 1, okay? So this says add probability of it being 2 and add probability of it being 3. That'll be 70%. And this is child's, <laughs> play, child's play, right? Okay. Um, if somebody asks, what's the, so there, so actually there's two ways to do this. One is you could add the probability of it being two and three. That uses the, dent, the probability function directly, or you could use the cumulative distribution function. You could take the probability of it being three, subtract off the probability of it being one, 
and you get the same answer. Okay. Yeah. Why would the uh, probability of performing three experiments in a row be higher than like two or one? Or is that just like the Yeah, so what this is saying is so when I say the probability of performing three, I mean exactly three successful experiments. So that so I'm I'm saying if I perform a group of four experiments, what's the probability I'll get exactly one successful experiment in a row, exactly two, exactly three, or exactly four? Yeah. So it's a given that if you get three successful, you've already got two before that, but this is not, that's the probability you get two and then fail the next time. Okay. All right, so you can use you know, the probability function here. You can use the cumulative distribution function. Either of them is fine to do this. All right. Okay, normally we're going to use um, continuous distribution functions, like um, where the, the random variable x is a real, basically it's a real number, okay? So, for example, if we're measuring um, level of a tank or temperature of a reactor or composition of a stream coming off a distillation column or whatever it might be, these are going to be real, real numbers. Okay, so they're going to be governed by a real, by I should say, a continuous probability distribution. Okay, so that pro I'm kind of done it backwards here. So, the the definition here, or I should just say the name of the function here. Tell me if you can see this chalk, it's cool looking. Okay, so that's the, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to say the probability function is f. Okay, that's the probability you'll get a particular value x. It's governed by this function. Okay, the probability that you'll get x or less is governed by the cumulative distribution function. Okay, when you have discrete va values, these functions, if we go back, Right, if we want to construct one function, let's say the cumulative distribution function right here, we did you can do this by summing the, the probability function. So this, if you, I've done it kind of differently here. Anyway, it's fine. Um, so <coughs> where'd I go? These two functions are related. So this is the equivalent of summing, I hope you can see. That if you have a continuous function, you don't sum, you integrate, right? You assume you learned that in calculus. So, the, so in general, this random variable x can assume values between plus and minus infinity, okay? It's a real number. So what we're doing to get the cumulative distribution is we're taking the probability function here, we're integrating it from the lower limit up to x, okay? I'm not great at drawing such things, but let's say here's f and here's x. Okay, and let's just say the function looks like this, just for fun, okay? And then, well, I should have gave it a nice little tail here, but maybe, you know, tails off, maybe that goes on for a long ways. We ask ourselves, what's the probability it'll be this value or less? It's, it's all that area there, okay? That's all that function does. It just integrates the area under the curve. And correspondingly, if someone gives you the cumulative distribution function and you wanted to get back the probability function, it's the, it's the derivative of this function. So they're related by, so if you have density function, or I should call it probability function, you can get the cumulative function by integration and you can go the other direction by differentiation. Okay? All right. And so same kind of things apply here. If you want to know the probability that, a, that the random variable x is between b and a, you can take the cumulative distribution function at b, evaluate it at b, subtract off that function, evaluate it at a, okay? That's equivalent, to, that's equivalent if you look up here, to integrating the de probability function between a and b, okay? So in other words, if you, wanted to ans this, if you wanted to answer this question, you had big F in hand, you would use it. If you didn't have big F in hand, you could either find it by doing this and then do this, but you might as well just integrate this function directly. Okay. And by definition, for this to be a proper probability function, this has to be true. If I integrate the area under the curve from minus infinity to plus infinity, this has to equal one. Okay. That just says the probability of all possible things is one. because that's how we define probability functions. All right. This probably stands as one of my worst drawings ever, by the way. <laughs> hey, we all have our limitations. 
The good news is mine is not math, but the bad news is mine is drawing mathematical things on the board. Okay. All right. So here's a little bit of example to give you an idea how you can manipulate these things. So I'm giving you this probability function, just giving it to you. Okay. I'm telling you f of x equals this value if x is between minus 1 and 1, and outside that range it's 0. This is a smooth continuous function, right? Because if you look at this, when you guys take math course somewhere, y you learn about things like differentiability and s continuity and things, right? And hopefully you know for real problems, w we're not interested typically in things that are not smooth and not continuous. So if you evaluate this function at x equal minus 1 or plus 1, you'll see it is 0. So it's, it's a nice looking function. It doesn't jump. It's not discontinuous or anything. That's good. I prefer that. Um, so if, first of all, I might ask you this question. Prove this is a legitimate probability function. Um, there's only one requirement as far as we're concerned at this point, and that's that if you integrate this function between zero, minus infinity and plus infinity, it better equal one. That's the only requirement we have, okay? So, I'm assuming you guys <laughs> at this point know how to, this is just a polynomial, it's easy to integrate, right? I hope you can do it. And if you were to integrate this thing, you'd find it's equal to one. Now you might say, well, that's magical, what luck. The, the, you know what I did is I integrated this function with a constant a, and I computed it had to be 0.75 for this to be one. <laughs> I wasn't lucky. You understand? Well, you, I specified this function because I knew I wanted this to be a times 1 minus x squared, where I didn't know what a was. I integrated this thing, and I computed what a had to be for it to be one. And that's 0.75. Okay. If this uh, were not the case, this is not a legitimate function, so you shouldn't be using it. <clears throat> okay, now I have the um, probability function here, and I want to get the cumulative distribution function. I can just integrate this thing, right? Integrate it from minus infinity up to some value x. So we can simplify this, right? Because nothing happens below minus 1, so I can make the lower limit minus 1, right? Because the function is 0, lower than that. Integrate that to x. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, plug in. Plug in my function. You know why I'm using v here, right? Because I don't want it to be confused with x. It's just a dummy variable integration. You guys have seen this before, I hope. <coughs> okay. So unless I made a mistake, if I integrate this guy and evaluate this at the limits, I get this here. I mean. I assume everyone can integrate and differentiate polynomials, so I'm not going to actually do that, but you could check it out if you want to make sure it's true. So that's the cumulative distribution function. So what I've done here is write it very explicitly. So if it's below minus 1, it's 0, okay? Because you know that from here, right? Eh. If this, this cumulative distribution function below minus 1 is 0. So if I want to know what the, sorry, this is the dent probability function. So the cumulative function also has to be 0 below minus 1. I mean, there's no area under the curve of 0. So, okay. And then between the two limits, minus 1 and 1, it's this function, right? And then if you get to an x of 1 or greater, it's equal to 1. Right? So I think I did not do this. Okay. So let's see if I can do this. This is challenging. For me, at least. That's not good chalk, is it? So I'm sure I'll do a bad job, but who cares? So here's f of x, and here's minus 1, and let's say here's 1. So, and this guy assumes a value. So when x is 0, it has, it's 0.75. So this is a function that I guess looks pretty much like this. And if, if I could draw, that would be 0 right there. So yeah, it looks like that. Okay. It's kind of, if you're familiar with the bell shape curve or Gaussian di normal distribution, it kind of looks like that, except it's, its tails are chopped off, if you know what I'm talking about. And so the cumulative distribution, the capital F of x versus x, is 0 until you get to minus 1, and then I guess it looks something kind of like this. And then once you get up to 
what value is this? Plus one, it's equal to one. Okay? All right. So that means if you want to know, for example, what the probability that something will be, let's say, here or less, it's going to be the area under the curve of this thing. Okay? Which I guess we'll do here in a moment. We shall. Okay? So now I ask the question, yeah? Um, so the 0.75 there represents from the maximum value of the distribution which occurs at zero? It's supposed to, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just <laughs> Yeah. Well, you can tell just by looking at that function that it's going to assume its maximum value at x equals zero, yeah. Okay. So now we ask ourselves the question, what's the probability that this um, random variable that's governed by this distribution, which we know, is going to be between minus one half and plus one half, okay? So that, to find this, you compute, well, there's several ways to compute it, but you can say, well, I know that's going to be the cumulative distribution function evaluated at 0.5 minus the cumulative distribution evaluated at minus 0.5. So in principle, I didn't do it this way. There's two ways to do it. I could evaluate, right, I have the function in hand. So I could plug in 0.5 there and minus 0.5 in there and subtract them and get the answer. But I chose to do it a different way or two ways. The other way to do it is, is if you didn't have this available and you only had the function f of x available, you'd integrate that between the limits a and b to find the area, right? That's the area under the curve here. Or, <laughs> sorry, over there somewhere. And if you do this, you'll find it's about, I don't know, 69%. So in other words, 69% of the time, we're going to find x between minus 1 half and plus 1 half, right? It's, the, you can see by the picture of the function here, the most probable value is, is it's going to be um, equal to zero, right? That's got the highest probability. And you might find it equal to minus point, you know, nine, 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 but it won't be very probable. So, any, you know. So you, so you got to, so when people ask you things like, what's the probability, like, w can this thing be point nine, 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 six? You're like, yeah, but. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> you know? Same thing I try to convince my daughter when she fears something terrible is going to happen. She just doesn't get the idea of statistics, though. So, kids, what are you going to do with them when they don't understand distribution functions? All right. So, now this is, this is something interesting. This is called the inverse probability. So, what I'm doing here is I'm saying, I'm using the cumulative distribution function, right? So when I say f of x, I mean that's the probability the random variable will be less than or equal to x. And I want this to be 0.95, and I want to find the value of x that gives me that, that cumulative distribution, right? So I want it to be 0.95. I know it's equal to this. So this would consist of solving this equation for x. I, can t I did this in MATLAB. There's no easy way to solve a cubic equation, right? Everyone knows the quadratic equation, I hope. Um, but I did it in MATLAB, and you'll find that it's 0.73. So if I could draw, which I can't, obviously. If you went over here to this curve, you would find, I don't know, 0.73 is over there. So 95% of the area, is that right? Yeah, 95% of the area is over there, and only 5% of the area is above that. Okay. So when we go into MATLAB, we don't use this function a lot, but you'll see there's a function that calculates the, you know, there's functions in MATLAB that ca calculate little f and big F and also